the stories of these women really helped to emphasize to me the primacy of God's love always before us, around us, surrounding us, upholding us, before us, behind us. <laughs> We're sort of swimming in it all the time. And it's a matter of putting on kind of the right glasses so that I can see what he is already doing. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological complexity. We explore the, the history of the church, theology, all that kind of fun stuff. So if you're into that, I encourage you to become a part of the community here. You can do that by hitting that subscribe button, but you know where it is, so I don't have to remind you of that. Anyway, what you're in store for today is a video with Liz Kelly. She is an author, a spiritual director, retreat leader. It was an absolute pleasure sitting down and talking with her, and we discuss female saints and virtues that they exemplify and how we can learn from those who have gone before us. And it was a great conversation. I got to learn about a lot of people that I had never heard of and just hear about these amazing women who really exemplify so many of the traits that we want to cultivate. So if you're interested in learning about awesome women of church history or how to grow in the virtues or something else, I don't know, but you're gonna enjoy this video. So anyway, I'll let you get to that in a second. But first I do wanna say thanks to my Patreon subscribers and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially my patrons who give money monthly to support me and this channel to keep it going and growing. Thank you guys so much. If you want to support the channel, you can go to gospelsimplicity.com and click donate and you can find Patreon at patreon.com slash gospelsimplicity or make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash gospelsimplicity. Thank you all so much for your support and enjoy the video. Well, today I am joined by Liz Kelly. Liz Kelly is a jazz singer who met Jesus in late night adoration, an award-winning author of nine books, including Jesus Approaches and Your Heart, His Home Prayer Companion. She holds advanced degrees in creative writing and Catholic studies. She is trained as a spiritual director and leads retreats with a particular focus on helping women to flourish in their faith. Liz, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Austin. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And today we're going to be discussing, I think it's your most recent book uh, titled Love mm -hmm. Like a Saint, where you uh, survey the lives of various female saints, as well as, um, well, we'll get into the technical terminology here in just a second. Mm -hmm. But I'd love yeah. uh, just to know what inspired you to write on this topic? Mm, I... Uh, when I was going through school for spiritual direction, we used materials by this wonderful holy Jesuit. His name's John Wickham, Father John Wickham, since deceased. Uh, but he had written a really sweet little book on the virtues with a little introduction to the virtue. And then he listed you know, several dozen verses to pray with about that virtue. And I remember the first time holding that book and thinking, oh, I really want to write this book, but I want to write it for women. And I also want to include stories of women, put a little more meat on the skeleton in terms of how that um, particular virtue is embodied. So that's where the idea came from. And then when COVID hit, and like everybody who does retreats and speaking and things, everything just kind of dried up for about a year. And I had a, a lot of time when I could read and research and really drill down more deeply into some of the women that I didn't know at all. So that's where it came from. That's wonderful. And I really love mm -hmm. the structure. It's neat to hear where that came from, because when I first mm -hmm. opened up the book, well, it was on a laptop, which you know, a shame to say, I'd rather read it in paperback. But that aside, <laughs> uh, I, I thought, you know, I knew I was in for a book on female saints, and I was going to learn some things. Mm -hmm. But the the angle of the virtues that you paired them with was a really mm -hmm. neat way of making it more, mm -hmm. more than just like a historical survey, but also kind of a devotional read, which I really appreciated. Yeah. I think one of the things that happened is, just as I was formulating kind of ideas and trying to get, gather up my thoughts for it, there was no way that I could write about more than one virtue per woman, or that would be a full hagiography. You know, I'd have to do, uh, you know, 800 pages on each woman. <laughs> and I, of course, wasn't interested in that. Um, and so by paring it down to just one 
virtue and really drilling down on that, I think you do get kind of a more intimate glimpse in a part of the woman's life rather than a whole historical kind of survey, as you said. And so that was kind of a happy accident of the book that I ended up just kind of concentrating on one or two virtues. I think that made them really accessible. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. a beautiful Bob Ross happy accident there. Yeah, um, yeah right, exactly. But mm -hmm. throughout this conversation, uh, we're going to be referencing people with various titles such as Servant of God, mm -hmm. Venerable, mm -hmm. Blessed, and Saint. And mm -hmm. those are a lot of titles. So for those that are mm -hmm. maybe new to this world, um, mm -hmm. what do those titles mean? What is kind of the delineations there? Sure. Well, when the... A church is interested in examining the life of someone looking for heroic virtue. Uh, that's called opening their cause. And at that point, uh, a, a person, a subject who's going to be examined in this way, they start to gather all kinds of witnesses, any kind of written documents and things like that. So as the, they move along through this stage, it takes a long time, many, many years. The church is very slow when she um, is looking for things like this. She really wants to be sure she gets it right. Uh, and... And so there's sort of different stages which delineate where you are on this path to being canonized. Uh, it begins with servant of God. It moves to venerable once it's been established that someone practiced heroic virtue. Um, when a miracle associated with that person has, has been verified, you move to blessed. And then after two miracles, you move on to saint. And I specifically wanted to choose women along that whole arc because including a laywoman, Eve Lavalier, whose you know cause has not been opened at all, um, because I think it's a little bit easier for us to see ourselves on it. <laughs> you know, that there is an arc that you start here and then you move there. And, and it's sort of gradual. Um, and it gives us a little bit more, I think, breathing room too. It makes the makes the women in the pages, I think, a little bit more accessible and real. I found that to be the case, and I really appreciate yeah. the way that you selected from across the spectrum. And as I go through, mm -hmm. actually, I'm not sure if I selected any saints specifically to talk about today. We'll, we'll see mm. as we go through. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, before we jump into some of the, the specifics of these people, because we're going to go through mm -hmm. certain people and the virtues that they uh, exemplified, I I'd love to know a, a bit more about the process. So you lead retreats and such, and COVID hit, and it's a great time to mm -hmm. research and write a book because mm -hmm. that has dried up, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's lots of female saints to choose from, though certainly it mm -hmm. seems the males sometimes get a bit more airtime or a bit more mm -hmm. well-known uh, in, say, your church history classes. But what mm -hmm. was the selection process like? I mean, that, that's a lot of people yeah. to choose from. And was there anyone that really stood mm -hmm. out to you as you were doing it? Yeah, and it's, in fact, um, the first woman that I really started to write about, even aside from a book project or anything, was Blessed Benedetta Bianchi Poro. Um, that sounds like it should come with Chianti and spaghetti, and it probably should. But, uh, and she's, uh, I met her, you know, we have this saying that you don't choose the saints, the saints choose you. So I was on retreat. A number of years ago with my assistant, we tried to make a retreat together every year. And that year, I just happened to have really bad vertigo and it was worse in the morning. And so I missed the morning conferences. And I went to my assistant, you know, just kind of quietly asked her, you know, what I miss. And she said, well, this morning they were talking about different saints. And there was one that really stood out. And it was this woman who, who had a really terrible disease. And she went blind and she went deaf. And eventually they signed the Italian alphabet into the palm of her hand. And that's how she communicated. And that was the only introduction that I had to Benedetta. And I was like struck by holy lightning. You know, you have those moments where it's like, zzz. so I went home from that retreat and I started to research her and I was like, who is this woman? I have to know who she is. At that point, she was just venerable. At some point after some months of research, I wrote my column about her. A um, couple of months after that, I get a phone call from a woman in Omaha and she says, could you come to Omaha and lead a retreat for us? I said, Sure. And I said, how did you find out about me? And she said, well, um, I was just having 
lunch yes yesterday or the day before with Benedetta's niece, and she told me I should start praying to Benedetta because my son is suffering this terrible illness. So I started looking her up and I found your article. So long story short, I ended up getting to meet Benedetta's niece. She lives here in the U.S., and she gave me a plethora of information on Benedetta in English that I would not have had otherwise. Uh, so it was just this remarkable um, sense. It's almost like Benedetta took me by the hand and she said, we're going to do this together. You know, she became like the anchoress for the book. And she was the first chapter I started and the last chapter I finished because I just wanted to do her so well. <laughs> and and I was literally asking her, what do you want me to highlight about your life? And so perseverance and friendship were the two things that kind of came up. And that was also, I think, at some of the suggestion of her niece, who, of course, knew her life far more intimately than than I did. And um, so that's kind of how the first basic chapter came to be. And then um, I went through sort of sorting through traditional and less traditional virtues and just praying about you know, what are things I really need to grow in <laughs> selfishly? You know, what would I like to learn more about? And and that's kind of how I accumulated then the women who exemplified each of these virtues, like obedience with Anne de Gagne. I had never heard of her before. I kind of stumbled onto her because I was looking specifically for young women um, who were saints and uh, and blesseds and venerables. And once I learned her story, of course, she died at age 10. Um, I, I was very, very struck by her story and obedience just sort of flew out of the pages reading her biography. So it was very easy to choose a virtue for her in that way. But that's kind of how it went. I would go into conversation with, you know, St. Josephine Bakita and say, what do you want me to highlight and really ask her intercession? That's wonderful. And <laughs> I, I have to say on a selfish note, I'm very glad that you said Anne de Gagne's name before me because I definitely wasn't going to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> um, but I, I did want to start yeah. with her because I, I really yeah. enjoyed her story. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I love mm -hmm. the, the virtue of obedience. And you talk about mm -hmm. it in your book that it's kind of a virtue that's, I don't know, fallen out of style, if you will, as many virtues tend to For do sure. in our yeah. time. But wh why do you think that that is that we struggle with this so much? And then I'd love to hear more about just how Anne de Gagne, uh, at such a young age, exemplified this. Yeah. When we speak of obedience in this context, we're speaking very specifically of the Christian virtue of obedience. And the overarching point in obedience in the Christian life is not obedience to a principle, but to a person, to a person. And we are motivated in this obedience. And I think what's so striking about Anne's story with respect to obedience is she wasn't obedient as a child like most child are. They're afraid of getting spanked or they're afraid of having their cookie taken away or whatever it is. Anne was obedient because she was deeply in love with the person of Christ. She had an extraordinary, well beyond her years, uh, connection, especially with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, and her obedience uh, flowed out of this love that she had for a person. So when we think about obedience and especially civil disobedience, which is very fashionable right now because this is kind of what's going on in the world and it's think we ha it's how we think we have to get things done uh, is through civil disobedience. Um, what we're doing is we're misreading the character of that virtue. We're misplacing the emphasis to a principle from a person. And, and that makes all the difference. If I am being obedient out of love, that becomes a gift that I give. If I'm being patient because I love someone, that becomes a gift that I can give to them. And it's, and it's less about, 
I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to, you know, this kind of closed fisted, I'm just going to do it out of the force of my will. Uh, rather, it becomes this sort of open handed gesture of this is something that I'm going to give from my heart. And, and that's a, that's a nuanced interpretation of obedience. And I think we've just lost that in the same way that we misread meekness as being, you know, something to be medicated rather than something to be cherished. Um, I think society generally tends to favor the extrovert to the introvert, uh, at least right now. And, and I think it has something to do with that as well. The introverts have a different sort of set of virtues many, much of the time than extroverts do. Um, so it's a, it's a complex kind of maneuver going on in our culture around obedience. Hey, we'll be right back to the interview. But first, I want to tell you about another sponsor for today, and that is Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors that exist to help you get the help you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was called You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. And what I wanted to do in that video was draw out the fact that so many people are struggling with mental health. And the last thing we want to do is make it more difficult for people to reach out to get the help they need by creating this stigma around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about and think we need to end in Christian circles. And that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling. They're counselors all will be counseling from a Christian perspective and you can connect with them from any country in the world. They have counselors that speak many different languages and hey if it's important to you to have a counselor from your specific tradition or background they can do their part to try to pair you up with one of them as well. All of their counselors are licensed with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with these counselors in a variety of ways. Four in fact you can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, or messaging, all of the messaging is secure. And if it's between scheduled ses sessions, you'll receive a response within 24 to 48 hours. If this is interesting to you, if you think this would be helpful for you or maybe a loved one, I'd encourage you to go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, first of all, you'll get 10% off your order and you'll be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours. Hours. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity to be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours and get 10% off your first month. Faithful Counseling costs $260 per month, which gets you unlimited messaging with your counselor and four 30-minute sessions. But again, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, you'll get 10% off that first month. Lastly, Faithful Counseling is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line or hotline. You can find one of them at www.crisistextline.org. Please do so. You can reach out. You do not have to do this alone. Well, thank you all so much, and I will let you get back to the video, but if you want to check them out, again, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. The link is in my bio and in the pinned comment. Well, back to the interview. That was a really insightful distinction you made there between obedience to a person and obedience to a principle. And I think that's something people mm -hmm. can really take away from this because, again, mm -hmm. you said, you know, it's a nuanced point, but it can make a lot of difference. And mm -hmm. that obedience out of love to a person is going to be so much more meaningful than to an abstract concept. That's really where growth is going to happen when it's obedience Absolutely. to a person, what makes it Christian obedience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that particular piece plays in every single virtue, you know, uh, uh, am, I, am I persevering um, out of love or am I trying to persevere because I want what that perseverance is going to get me at the end? You know, it's two completely different postures. And in most of us, they're kind of mixed. You know, it's like, I want to be obedient to the, to the food plan my doctor gives me because it's good for me, but also because I like the, you know, the benefits of, of whatever else might come with it. So there's often that kind of mix and, and when we're striving for virtue, but if we keep the person of Christ at the center, it completely changes our posture toward the virtue. Well said, well said there. Mm. Another virtue mm. that I think is falling out of style as well, but also requires some nuance, 
is that of patience. Mm -hmm. And it's another one that you mm -hmm. highlight in your book. Mm -hmm. And I think especially mm -hmm. like in our chronically busy society, patience is very lacking. It seems that saying you're busy is almost the new status symbol. How are you doing? Oh, I'm busy, but I'm good. As though mm -hmm. we should be proud of being busy in that way. But yeah. I loved what you wrote and I want to read it here. You write, we cannot overstate it. Patience is a powerful force for healing, conversion, and the abundant mm -hmm. release of grace. When practiced well, not as a kind of dull passivity, but as a companion to acceptance and courage, patience will naturally lead to a deeper, richer life, certainly not one lived on the surface. And I think a lot of people are going to hear that and, and resonate with that. We, we know patience mm -hmm. is good, but I think for other people, especially <laughs> in our kind of like rugged individualistic society, like patience is just going to get me left behind. I got stuff to do. I got to get it done. How can I afford to be patient? So if they're kind of skeptical, how does patience lead to this deeper, richer life? And then we'll, we'll jump into the saint uh, next. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, um, all of the virtues do this to some degree or another, but I think at the root of patience, it is developing a spiritual poise within you, which allows me not just to react to what's going on around me, but to respond, which is, again, a shift in posture. Um, am I reacting with my hair on fire and the sky is falling and, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, let's, let's get a solution just like this. Or am I going to take in uh, the world around me or the problem before me and pray about it and make a plan to respond? So it's the difference between responding versus reacting. And a response to a problem I think tends to have far more long reaching, long term positive effects than an immediate reaction. You know, we don't want to trust our immediate reactions because they're not always good ones. <laughs> they're not always right, you know, um, and, and patience uh, teaches to, uh, teaches us to stand in that moment of pause. And, and to really allow all the information to come in before we make a decision. So, um, you know, again, I think, uh, especially with like email and social media and all of these texting, they, they, people just want an instant response to everything. But you're not getting an instant response. You're getting in a reaction. You know, you're getting a reaction response has legs, you know, it has roots. <laughs> it goes deep. <laughs> Reaction is like mist and it's gone, you know. So that's what I mean, that patience tends to give us a more rooted life, a deeper life. That's a beautiful distinction there as well. And I, I also appreciate the fact that it's alliterated with uh, <laughs> the reaction and response. But it's so true. I think so many people, whether they've lived for five years or 50 years or 100 years, recognize that oftentimes when we make a very quick reaction, it's usually not our we're not giving our best in that moment. It, it's more mm -hmm. impulsive. And maybe sometimes it works. And then maybe mm -hmm. sometimes it really backfires. Usually when people mm -hmm. talk about maybe putting their foot in their mouth, they usually didn't think about what they were going to say for, you know, a few seconds even before they said it. And that mm -hmm. difference of a response being something that is rooted in patience and has legs, I like how you put that, is really mm -hmm. neat there. I, mm -hmm. I want to jump into the person that you highlighted for this, which is mm. Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora, who I had mm -hmm. also not heard of. Actually, I'm not mm -hmm. sure any of the people that I'm going to highlight in this conversation I had heard of which mm -hmm. doesn't say a lot about them, probably more about me, but... Um, <laughs> I hadn't heard of her either, so okay, you're in good, okay, company. I'm in good company. There mm -hmm. we go. I feel better now. But mm -hmm. tell me a bit about more about her and the audience, mm -hmm. because I found her story interesting for a couple of reasons. So I, I find myself drawn to the mystics. I, I, there's just something so interesting about them. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. also really like seeing people who are both holy and married, even though her marriage was certainly not what we mm -hmm. might hold up in a, a marriage book per se. Um, sure. but, but that combination of things was really interesting mm -hmm. to me. So I'd love for you to share about her life. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, she grew up um, um, in, I want to say the 1800s, um, 
I'm forgetting what year she was born. In any case, uh, at first she wanted to be a nun, but she had had tuberculosis. And in those days, illnesses would sometimes sort of take you out of contention for different vocations. And so she wasn't allowed to enter uh, the convent. Um, and not long after that, she married. Uh, she married uh, very young, and she married a man who uh, turned out to be, um, at first he was incredibly possessive of her and just uh, held her like this precious jewel. And that kind of spilled over into a jealous obsession. Um, it, to make a long story short, the marriage was very troubled. Uh, he ended up being unfaithful and very publicly unfaithful. Um, he was very abusive to her in his language. And there were a few occasions when he uh, was violent with her. Um, in response to that, um, Elizabeth uh, took all of this to prayer and had a very, very specific invitation from God to stay with this man and to pray for his conversion, his complete conversion. And she had great confidence in that word that she was given. And I think it's really important at this point to say, <laughs> this is not an advocating of people staying in relationships that are abusive in any way, physically, verbally, emotionally, in, in any way. The church is not arguing that. Um, you could say, you could use a similar parallel with Mother Teresa, for example. If Mother Teresa had gone to a psychologist and explained this aridity that she was experiencing in the last 50 years of her life, they might have been tempted to put her on medication. Where um, what was happening with Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa, was she was being invited into a very specific kind of spiritual experience with God. And very few people are invited to the degree that she was. And in the same way, Elizabeth believed that she was being invited into this radical fidelity and patience with this man who just fell down again and again and again and very rarely offered um, uh, apologies for his terrible behavior. Um, and in doing that, though, <laughs> <laughs> she was protected on a number of levels, physically, emotionally. She had many mystical experiences. She was able to protect her children. Her children were never harmed by this man. And furthermore, she didn't harm them mentally by saying, oh, your dad is such a jerk. Oh, he's so terrible. You know, she tried her best to preserve that relationship to the degree that was um, available to her, which is really heroic. I mean, we hear about divorced couples using their kids against each other all the time. And so she resisted that temptation. Um, but more than anything, she just continued to speak back to him um, forgiveness and a, a, this radical patience and this kind of knowing, I know you're going to have a conversion, you know, and it's going to be big. <laughs> and in the end, it was. But, you know, maybe you have more specific questions about her life or yeah, I I think what I just found so fascinating was, I mean, it not, I, I guess, you know, growing up on a steady diet of like Hallmark movies around Christmas time, I, I have sure. a bit of a soft spot for the, the, the fact that it came full circle in that. But it, it was mm. remarkable to read just her, her patience and all that she went through. And again, I think it, I'm really glad you highlighted that, that this isn't necessarily something that the church or like is advocating for people right. to go through that this was a specific calling and that if, if people find themselves in that situation, I don't want them to hear this and say that's their calling too, because I don't, I don't think that's what you're saying. And I, I know it's right. what I'm saying as well, but the way that right. her patients ended up being a witness to her spouse, I think was just a beautiful thing. And I know that I have talked to people on in this community that, you know, they're just, they love Jesus and it breaks their heart that their spouse doesn't too. 
But through her yeah. patience, she was able to bring that about. And I wonder maybe if you could just speak to that dynamic at the end there, because I, mm-hmm. I know a lot of people who find themselves in relationships where they're, they're kind of mismatched there, but they want to be faithful. Yes. And they, yes. is, is this someone that could give them some inspiration for that? I think one of the great gifts that Elizabeth received, she she was denied the kind of safety and intimacy that she should have been granted through her relationship with her husband in her marriage. And I think what Jesus did was to replace that with a mystical intimacy and safety that she experienced directly with the Lord himself. So yes, there was this denial uh, this her husband's incapacity or unwillingness to um, admit his faults and and to change and and to repent and and do differently, but instead, because I think um, Elizabeth was willing to accept that that the Lord sort of replaced it and magnified what was lost in this mystical life that she experienced. So she was having all these sort of mystical visions of things, and this was in a way, uh, you know, what fed her and what kind of kept her going um, when she was being denied everything that she absolutely had a right to um, in in her human marriage. There was this mystical marriage that that took place instead. Um, and I think that she is a an example, especially to people who are being denied um, that kind of spiritual intimacy. You know, I think my husband and I pray together every night together every night. You know, we, n- we never miss, you know, unless one of us is someplace else. And it's my favorite time of day to just sit there and pray with him. And and the pain that that must be to not have that uh, must be very great indeed. And so um, I think that she stands as an example of you can live without this. It won't be, um, <clears throat> it, you won't miss out on any of the pain of it. It's still going to be painful. But when you offer it to God, he can take it and magnify it and make it something, uh, somehow a gift because that's what he does. You know, um, I open a, ta- a can of like rotten tomato soup and that's all I can make with it. But God can take something rotten and turn it into a feast. You know, that's his operation. That's his whole way of working. He takes the crucifixion and turns it into the resurrection. So that same operation can be applied to our lives and our suffering. So if I'm in a situation where, um, you know, my marriage is cold or um, I'm being denied the sort of safety and affection that I have every right to expect, I can give that to Jesus and and say, you make something of this. Elizabeth's life teaches us that he will accept that and take that and make something beautiful of it. And we need to be patient waiting for (laughs) how that's going to unfold. In her case, it was just extraordinary. Yes. And I love how you tied patience back in there because Mm -hmm. it's not that she knew that this was going to happen tomorrow. Like she was patient in that process. And right. From what I read through you about her life, it seemed it wasn't about, and again, how the virtues work. It wasn't Mm -hmm. just that, okay, I'm only doing this because I know the the end game of this. I've seen it, but I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be patient in this. And then God rewarding that in such a magnificent way. Uh, Just such a powerful Mm -hmm. story to read. Another person I want to talk about, she might have been my favorite person in this book, uh, was Servant of God, Catherine DeHuke Doherty. And something mm-hmm. I, I, she was, she just seemed fun. She seemed like someone I'd want to sit down <laughs> with, a little little feisty. Mm-hmm. And But something that really jumped out to me was this practice of, and here's another word I'm probably going to mispronounce, but Paustinic mm-hmm. or Postinic. I'll write it. Postinia. Pustinia. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Yeah, yeah my Russian yeah. is uh, non-existent. Um, but I found this so interesting. Uh, could, could you describe it a bit? Because I think people are going to really yeah. enjoy this practice. 
Yeah, I love her. She is. She's feisty. She had a real life, you know, real life, very full. Um, uh, and she, she um, and I think I love her so much because I'm probably part hermit myself. You know, I think my husband is too. So we're very well matched in that um, sort of part hermit. But Postinia is uh, a Russian tradition. Um, and, and in brief, it's choosing to live as a hermit, but in the world. So, for example, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis on the Bible, only the Bible. You don't take a lot of other spiritual reading with you into the Pustinia. You take the Bible, the Bible alone. You read it on your knees. You read it with a certain kind of surrender to it. Um, and you may spend weeks or months in a kind of hermit-like existence, and then one day there might be a knock at the door, and it's the local farmer saying, it's time to bring in the harvest. Can you help? And the pustinic is available then to do that, um, to, to live a life of service outside of the hermitage. But And that's, that's a very... Um, rough uh, kind of translation of of what the 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 Russian pustinic is but it's a very great call to live in silence and deep prayer with scripture it was really interesting to read and it reminded me of the way of the pilgrim mm -hmm. and i'm not sure if there's a connection there or not uh, but the, the famous book there and the the emphasis on silence I thought was a really a cool virtue to pick out if you can call a virtue cool, um, but a, a needed one, a necessary one, perhaps a better mm -hmm. adjective. Um, but but before we jump into that a little more, I'd love for people just to get the chance to hear more about uh, Servant of God Catherine de Hugh Doherty because her her life was really interesting and just a, a fun person to read about. Mm -hmm. She grew up. Um... Uh, she was her first experience of Catholicism was uh, the Russian uh, Orthodox Church, and um, she was also married at a very young age to a gentleman who um, ended up being abusive and unfaithful. Uh, because she was so young when she married, well, uh, they had to flee Russia because of the Bolshevik revolution and at one point she was actually shot in the hand um during a kind of a riot on the street um they moved to canada they fled i think first to england and then moved to canada and um she was granted a divorce from this gentleman and at that point she really felt a call to reintroduce the tradition of Pustinia uh, around her. She had an incredible heart for the poor and the homeless and um, basically was poor and homeless herself in many ways. She discovered, um, she had a, a, a few young kids and she discovered that uh, she had a real capacity to speak with eloquence and strength about the life of the spirit, the Christian life. And so people would invite her to come and speak. Um, she would speak to groups and seminarians and all this sort of thing. And eventually she ended up um, establishing uh, a number of different houses that were dedicated to practicing as a group uh, this sort of hermit-like life and people could come and show up at any time and make retreats. And they were invited then to just sort of live as they lived. And people came and went. She had houses in Canada. She had houses in Harlem. Uh, eventually, she was being interviewed by um, uh, a, a famous journalist at the time. And much to the surprise of many around her later in life, uh, they married. And, um, and so it was this great source of reclaiming um, this married love. And, and that was a source of uh, bifurcation with some within her group. So she had a kind of a bumpy path. <laughs> but everywhere she went, she um, flourished, blossomed, and I think, and, and achieved extraordinary 
things. It did extraordinary services for the people around her, the poor, the impoverished, single mothers, that kind of thing, because she had her roots in this practice of Pustinia, of entering into silence, which is not just about turning off what you're hearing. It's about listening for the first time. You know, it, it's about truly opening your ears. <laughs> so it's this twofold thing. It's one of like shutting out certain noises so that you can hear the voice of God. And can't we all use that in our <laughs> world today? I mean, I don't think there's ever been a time that we've been able to have so much input in our lives and it can be great things. It, I mean, mm -hmm. as we do this, you know, people will one day be watching this in the future and I, I hope it's a mm -hmm. good input for them. But even with great things, I think there's a need mm -hmm. today to be able to have that, those times of silence and to slow down and to really, like you said, not just turn off the noise, but begin to listen to the right things in that. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love, you know, for you, maybe whether it's this practice or just silence in general, <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that are drawn to this. I think we recognize that, okay, we probably do have like an overstimulation problem today, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. seems daunting to try to turn down that volume or to really disconnect. And mm -hmm. many people I know like actually feel physically anxious now if they don't have some type of background mm -hmm. music or something to really sit alone can be difficult. And so mm -hmm. what would you recommend for people who say, okay, like, I probably need this in my life, but I don't know how to start, even though it sounds quite simple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a spiritual discipline that needs to be trained up like any spiritual discipline. So I, I'm not going to go on a 30-day silent retreat to start. <laughs> I'm going to start much smaller than that. You know, I think small goals... Um, kind of like training for a marathon, you know, first you run a mile and then you run two and then you run five and, and they kind of build on each other. So you can start really small and you can identify, you know, the first thing maybe to do is to just kind of take an inventory of how much of your day is taken over by screens and phones and things like that. Um, and is there space in your day at all for silence, even if it's just five minutes? And then you can start just with five minutes. Um, uh, I'll often tell, you know, people come in for spiritual direction, you know, a lot of times they don't need spiritual direction. What they want is a prayer life and they don't know that they don't have it. And so um, some of it is just learning to get quiet so that you can pray in a super simple um, way to begin this is just taking in a few deep breaths, letting out a few deep breaths. And I think of it sometimes as like breathing in the Holy Spirit, exhaling the self, you know, breathe in the Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, exhale the distractions. <laughs> you know, even just doing that simple little practice can predispose you to prayer with scripture or prayer with sacred reading or something like that. So starting small, you know, we do not despise small steps. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with starting really small and building on that um, so that you can do more and more heroic feats. You know, you can go on a three-day silent retreat and it refreshes you. It doesn't scare you, you know. That's such an important principle you hit on there. And for whatever reason, I think it's often lost in spiritual growth because I see so often that in every other area of people's lives, if it's running a marathon, like you said, they, they know, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to have to start with maybe like two miles if I can do two mm -hmm. miles and then I'll build it up slowly and steadily or they don't go mm -hmm. into like the weight room and just stack on all the heaviest plates and say like, this is going to end well, let's start here. <laughs> they, they start yeah. small, you know, they, they recognize <laughs> that it's a journey. Yeah. But yeah. so often we read, and I think especially it's good for this conversation because we read of these lives of saints and these heroic acts of virtue and we say, okay, mm -hmm. I guess I need to do that. I'll start tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we miss the fact that for them, too, this was a process. This was a journey. They, they mm -hmm. built up to these things. It's a long 
a journey in the same direction as I think Eugene Peterson has a book on that title, that spiritual growth mm-hmm. is that continued journey in the right direction. I'm so glad you brought that up mm-hmm. because I think it's so mm-hmm. important for people to grasp that. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Small steps. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned her, I think, at the very beginning of this interview that you selected a lay woman and I didn't quite pull her out on the outline, but Eve Lavalier, I think. And uh-huh. she had this beautiful uh, inscription that you put uh, that you noted that she had on her tombstone that I have left mm-hmm. all for God. He alone mm-hmm. is sufficient for me. And I thought that really mm. just was a great kind of uh, topic sentence for the whole book. As I mm. kind of look through the lives of these people that I have left all for God. He alone is sufficient for me. Mm-hmm. And again, I think people hear that and they say, maybe they'll feel a sense of guilt. Like I'm not there and I feel like I should be. And so I need to be there like tomorrow and that'll mm-hmm. last like 20 minutes and then they'll go back to watching Netflix <laughs> or doing whatever. And I, I, I think that we recognize that's where we want to get, but but we're maybe not there yet or that we reckon when we have to recognize there's a journey between here and there and that mm-hmm. we continue to take those small steps. And mm-hmm. if you don't mind, and I know I, I didn't prep her on this outline, but mm-hmm. could you say a little bit about her story? Because it was a journey for her. She didn't start there. Yeah. It's not like she woke up and there she is, but it was a journey. Yeah. yeah. And she, I loved her story. I just fell in love with her story in part because um, she had so much worldly success. Um, we might think of her in terms of like a Hollywood starlet. You know, she had it all and and she left all of that. Um, because she had this encounter with Christ that was so real. It was the first real thing she had ever experienced. And she's like, now that I've tasted what it's like to live, I can't possibly go back to this Hollywood existence, which is all completely false. And and um, so I, I love her story, and I love her story too, just because you know I was a singer for many years, and so to see an actress and someone who was really engaged in the arts in that way um, uh, uh, leave, you know, there wasn't anything uh, about her acting that was immoral, but there was a lifestyle that went with it. In her case, um, that she was very happy to let aside. The other thing I think that's really important to remember about Eve too is she was the victim of a violent crime when she was young, and uh, she observed her father uh, killing her mother. And her father then tried to kill her, shot at her, missed her, and then took his own life. So she was orphaned uh, very young. She grew up in a very abusive household. And um, I I think violent crime has become (laughs) far too common. And um, I think a lot of people who have suffered from it, either directly or indirectly, can take heart to see that Even something as egregious and as painful, bitterly painful, as what she suffered, um, she could be walked through it. You know, she could be walked through it. I had the chance to, uh, last summer, write a story about a woman here who 30 years ago, um, her first husband uh, murdered their children and then himself. And so 30 years later, she was talking about this experience and how God had brought her through it. And Eve's life really reminded me of that, that, um, you know, again, this isn't something where, uh, and, and she used this phrase, she said, you know, people would say, oh, God never gives you more than you can handle. And she said, there is absolutely no way I was ever going to handle the murder of my children. That was not ever going to happen. But she said, but God did walk me through it. He never left my side as I was moving through this experience of mourning and grieving and rage and everything else that would, would be accompanying that. And I think this a similar kind of thing happened with Eve that she met a, a community that was willing to walk with her through um, this conversion reversion sort of experience that she had and to let her take her time and do what she needed to do 
And that was that witness of being willing to walk with her through that was very compelling and it changed her whole life. And of course, uh, she was vaulted into this by reading the stories of Magdalene and Magdalene's experience with Christ. So, um, you know, again, just that sense of the women in these pages help us to see that the gospel story is our story. It belongs to us. It We're in those pages. It's meant for us. And I think Eve does that as effectively as Magdalene did. I really liked the way that you kind of par- paralleled her as a, a modern uh, Mary Magdalene in that. Mm-hmm. And it it was such a, a beautiful and gripping story. And I love that you also highlighted that she had that community around her that mm-hmm. So many people, I mean, a a lot of these saints have this heroic, uh, and as as Americans, I think we like to highlight, for instance, um, oh, her name is, was it, uh, yeah, Elizabeth Canori Moore, that, you know, she was kind of by herself, and we're we're drawn to that. We're like, ah, she kind of did it, but she had people around her too, but I think especially it's important to see in Eve, like, the the making of a saint often takes a, a, you know, if they say it takes a village to raise a child, how right. much more so with the saint, the people around them who we may mm-hmm. never know their names, but who had that influence mm-hmm. on their lives. I think that's a really neat thing. And it's also neat to make that connection how for Eve, she was inspired by a woman who had gone before her and then helped by those around her. And that's kind of what this is all about. You know, this isn't just a, a historical exercise and learning fun facts about cool people, though, if you want to do that, this, this will work. But it's so much more. It's seeing how we're connected to those who have gone before us and being inspired by them and being able to kind of learn from them in that way. And one of the things I really took away from this, and it was in this final chapter, that the virtue was love. But Mm -hmm. what it really was about, at least on my reading, wasn't necessarily the love of Eve, though it was great, or the love of Mary Magdalene, though it was extraordinary Mm -hmm. as well. But really, it kept coming back to the love of Christ. It it kind of shifted that Mm -hmm. emphasis of ultimately what this isn't about is putting these people on a pedestal, though they are Mm -hmm. amazing, but Mm -hmm. how they reflect the love of Jesus and how that's Mm -hmm. at the core. And I'm I'm just curious, this process of of reading through these lives of of such hardship and such faithfulness as well, what did it teach you about the love of Jesus? Mm, that's a great question. I love the tomb scene in the gospel where Mary Magdalene is looking for the greatest love of her life. You know, she thought she has lost the greatest love that she has ever known. She thought it was lost to her. And in that moment of her seeking the Lord seeking, even if it's just his body, just his dead body, that what happens is he finds her, (laughs) you know, he finds her. She's the one looking, seeking, longing. Oh, I think I've lost it all. And yet he finds her, calls her by name. You know, she turns, falls at his feet, clings to him. You know, if that's not a microcosm of every sort of spiritual life, <laughs> we are looking for this love, this love that we ha- we can hardly even believe exists. We think it might be lost to us. And instead, you know, there's God who's found us and is waiting there for us all, all the while that I think it, the stories of these women really help to emphasize to me the primacy of God's love always before us, around us, surrounding us, upholding us, before us, behind us. <laughs> We're sort of swimming in it all the time. And it's a matter of putting on kind of the right glasses so that I can see what he is already doing, which is to love me. He's, he's already doing that. That's already being done right now. It's like, do I have my spiritual spectacles on that I can see what he is up to? And um, I think the women in these pages discovered that in different, you know, in their different ways and in their different lives. But that part of their heroic virtue came from a willingness to look for and to trust that God was active 
all the time that there was nothing on his agenda that day but to love them. And they really trusted that. They really were willing to believe that. And and if they can teach us that a little bit in our own lives, I mean, I'll, I'll be really, really happy with <laughs> if, if there's some of that results from the encounter with this book. Um, you know, God is actively loving, rescuing, and redeeming you right now. Amen. What a what a beautiful <laughs> vision for the book. And thank you for that that picture of Mary Magdalene as well. I mean, what a what a beautiful, like you said, microcosm of, of the whole spiritual life of us seeking mm -hmm. after only to realize that we've been the ones that are found. And mm -hmm. it's such a, a beautiful picture. And I think a great place to begin to wrap up. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. for your time. I'm so grateful for your book, the impact it's had on me and I'm sure mm -hmm. so many others. Thank and I'm you. excited to get to share it with them. Of course, the links mm -hmm. will be uh, for that will be in the description for people to check out. But I, I imagine there could be people that listen to this and think, man, like this is really exciting, but it's only scratching the surface. Not only is there mm -hmm. a whole book to read, but there's hundreds of lives to look at, or <laughs> thousands. Like, where do I even begin if they get hooked on mm -hmm. this and they say, I want to learn more about these amazing women or men that have gone mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. us and paved the way in certain ways? Mm -hmm. Like, where can they go to learn more? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, outside of the book, I think a, a really good habit to get into. And one I started a while ago is to spend a year with one saint. And uh, for example, this year I'm spending the year with St. Maximilian Kolbe. So he just happened to be an academic and he wrote a lot and he had newsletters. And so there's a lot of material that he wrote that I can read. There's also just an exquisite hagiography on him, just a beautiful um a biography called Man for Others. So I, I spend every morning trying to get into a little bit of his thought. What what did he love and why did he love it? And how did, why did he make the choices that he made? Um, you know, of course, he's, uh, they call him the saint of Auschwitz. He, he took another man's place uh, to die in the starvation bunker um, in World War II. Uh, just an extraordinary life cut short. Um, but I think that the discipline of spending a full year with a figure like that, um, I think it helps to impress upon me um, not only their holiness, but also their humanness and and how those two things were married and, and matched and melded in that person. Uh, and that's been a really important spiritual discipline for me to just really spend a good full year with someone and just really praying about like who's going to be the next person and, and you know, allowing that person again to come and find me <laughs> um, and trusting that, you know, there's something that God wants me to know in knowing more fully the experience of that person's whole life and not just one little book about them or one little article about them. Not that those things aren't helpful, but um, again, it puts a little more meat on the skeleton of what holiness looks like walking around in the world. And what does that mean then for me? Plus I have another really cool friend in heaven who <laughs> I can ask to pray for me. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a really neat spiritual discipline. I thank you for sharing that because not only, you know, does it give people ideas of, you know, okay, I can look around for people. The book might give people a, a launching pad. Maybe this mm -hmm. one of the people in the book will be someone that yeah. someone spends a year with, but it, it gives mm -hmm. them this really practical way of taking this information and taking it from just kind of like, historical facts to something that helps mold your life. And I'm really grateful for you sharing that. And I'm sure many others will be as well. Well, I want to thank you again for your time today, Liz. And I'd like to really allow fun. you to close by just letting people know where they can find your work or if they're interested in the retreats you do or anything like that. Huh? Let, yeah. let them know. The best place to go is my website. It's lizk.org. It's like the shortest URL in the world, L-I-Z-K dot org. And it's got speaking. It's got samples of different talks that I've given. It's got all the books on there. It's got my speaking schedule and retreat schedule. And it's going to be a really full year with COVID restrictions listing. We're, uh, lifting. We're going to be in 
Oregon and Texas and California and Connecticut. And I know I'm forgetting some places, but um, uh, I would love to see you at a retreat. That's wonderful. I will be sure to link to LizK.org. It will not take many uh, hammerings on the keys there to get that one out. But thank you again. And thanks to everyone that watches this sometime in the future. I do not take your time lightly. I am so grateful that you would stick around to this point with us. And I'll close as I always do by saying that until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. But most importantly, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I want to say a big thank you before we go to our sponsor for today, another one of them, Kindred. Kindred is a ministry that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God in their daily lives. And they do this by creating some of the most beautiful Bibles I've ever seen. You're going to see some videos of them here as I talk, and I think you'll really enjoy them. If you haven't gotten one already, I'd encourage you to go to kindredapostle.com and to check them out. And if you do so, use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order. Whether you just want like a beautiful coffee table book, you're looking for a gift for someone who is difficult to buy for because they're just like a Bible nerd. If so, they probably watch this channel. Well, if they watch this channel, they're probably a Bible nerd. This could be a great thing for them. Or if you just want a different way to approach the Bible, I'd encourage you to check them out. So again, that's kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Truly, that means so much to me. I really appreciate all of you. If you enjoyed it, I'd encourage you to click like, and maybe even if you're feeling wild and crazy, click subscribe and the bell to stay tuned for more. Until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace.